Romans. Romans. Hey, good to see you, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Come on, clap your hands with me if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. It's the joy of the Lord that gives us our strength. So I'm glad to, I'm glad to see that you're feeling that joy, too. Before we do anything else, I'd like to introduce myself. Those of you who may not know me, my name is Elliot. My wife, Tiffany, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves one time. Go ahead. Because you're awesome. And we love you. Woo! I believe from the bottom of my heart that God has a message for you, a message of hope, encouragement, and love that he wants to speak directly into your life today, that you're not here by accident. You're here because God has led you to be here today. It is not by coincidence. It's not because that random person invited you. It's not because your grandma made you come. It's because God has something he wants to say to you today. He has something he wants to say to you today from his word. I truly believe that, and if you believe that with me, go ahead, say amen to activate your faith. Amen, Lord, I believe you have something for me today. So, hey, before we get started, before we get started in the message today, I want to bring you up to speed. I missed you guys last week so much you don't even know. Some of you were like, you weren't here? <laughs> Neither was I. <laughs> but that's all right. That's okay. See, because if I wasn't here, then it's all right that you're not here too, I guess. Um, we were in Nashville. We were in Nashville. Uh, we, were, we were going to, to our annual Foursquare Connection, which is our annual convention where all the pastors of all the four square churches in all the United States all meet. There was about 4,000 ministers there, and we got blessed so much. Jesus Culture did worship. Lisa Brevere was one of the speakers. It was crazy awesome. We, we got inspired. We got filled up to the top, and we also voted in a new president. Randy Remington is our new president of Foursquare starting next year. He's our president-elect, and it was just an amazing time. Um, there was, this, uh, there was this aspect of the conference that I want to bring back to you um, because there was, two, there was two nominees. There was two nominees to be the president of our movement. We're an interdenominational movement, which means we're, we're organized together, right? And Tiffany and I have accountability. We're not here out, you know, lone rangering it out here. We have accountability, and we, we enjoy that. We actually thrive on that kind of accountability. Foursquare is that. And we had two nominees to be the president, and it was Tammy Dunahoo, which was our vice president for many years, and another guy, Randy Remington. And when Randy got voted in, Christianity Today wrote this article like, oh, no women in leadership for the Foursquare Church, I guess, and we're all like, come on, Christianity Today, why you got to be like that towards us? It was like this big elephant in the room that if you're a minority or if you're a woman, you don't have a voice, and it was totally from the pit of hell. It was not true, but you know what our leadership did? I'm so proud of our leadership of Foursquare. They went up there on their platform in front of 4,000 pastors and said, hey, you know what? If you're feeling that way, women, if you're feeling um, undervalued, if you're feeling passed over, we just want to acknowledge that right there. And a, and a male pastor went up and said, on behalf of every male that's ever looked you over because of your gender, I'm sorry. I was like, Dang, that's crazy. That's a crazy thing to do in front of so many people. But our leadership owned it, went right up and, and just owned it. Even though we think that if you do feel that way, it's probably because of a place of hurt, whatever, whatnot. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be totally 100% right in order to say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to acknowledge the fact that you might be feeling hurt, and I'm going to own that. That's a, that's a really mature for our movement to do, so I was really proud of that. That was just one takeaway. I could give you many, but I only got a limited amount of time, y'all. So that was like the most important thing. Um, another thing that I want to share with you, um, I don't always do this. I usually jump right into the message, but I wanted to share with you a quick update on the recovery house that we want to have. So if you've been coming to this church for any length of time, um, you know that, that we are a lifeline to this community, and that's our identity, that's our brand, that's our name, because we want to be a lifeline to this community. That means we want to have a recovery center in this city, offering detox, rehabilitation, and transitional living, taking the people that nobody wants, turning them into people that everybody wants, because, you know, that's my story. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic, and I came through that, and I want to be able to provide that. It's a God vision for us, and a quick update on that. Um, for those of you who are not on social media or don't follow us or me on social media because I post all, a lot of updates there. There is a house that has potential to be ours. It's not ours yet. It has potential to belong to us. And we have Lifeline Thrift. That's right up the street right here. Separate nonprofit that we're also um, over. And we want to own that house from 
Lifeline Thrift, Lifeline Recovery Center, that nonprofit. And it's so close, everybody. It's so close. But I would ask you to pray. Pray, because it just seems like the closer we get, the more the enemy of our soul wants to come in and be like, no, go ahead, stop, you know, this, that, the other thing, get in the way, block. And we're like, no, (laughs) no, we're going to do this. It's so close. We just heard from some leadership in our Foursquare movement that they're going to help us by sending down some leaders to be over that house. I'm telling you guys, it it could be weeks before we start taking men in off the street. I start bringing, we've been talking about this for years, for years we've been talking about this, and you've been so good to me because nothing has happened for years. Not that nothing has happened, but we've had nothing to say, look, it's happening, but I'm telling you, it's so close. So continue to pray for that recovery house more as it develops. I will share more as it develops how you can help, how you can be a part. One way you can be a part is just by going down the Lifeline Thrift and being a volunteer there. That is the money maker that's supposed to generate revenue for that house. So I would encourage anybody who's looking for something to do extra during the week. I know all of you have a bunch of free time on your hands, but this is an opportunity. I, I don't talk about serving as like a need. Hey, guys, hey, we need you. It's not like that. No, this is your opportunity to get involved in something that's way bigger than yourself and to say, I'm, I'm, I'm partnering with something that's bigger than me because I believe all of us have something inside that says, I want to be a part of something bigger than me. I want to be a part of something that's making a difference in the world. And that's just one small way that you can do that is by getting involved in our, in our thrift store over there and helping generate some revenue by keeping it clean. Come on, people, because people like to shop in clean environments, keeping it clean, keeping that place stocked, donating over there, donating your time, donating your, your, your goods, and you got it. You got all that. So last thing I want to share with you is that this is your last Sunday to get live training to be a life group leader because life is better together, and we want to see as many life groups happen this summer. I don't want you to do your summer alone. That's what's really all about. Summertime is coming. It's about to be a lone summer for some of you, and I, that's not good. Don't do summer alone. Do summer with a life group, people who can be there for you and pray for you and be there when you need them most. When it's hot outside and you're feeling like, I want to die. Oh, I'm just suffering right here. You need to be in a life group so people can come around you and fan you and also blow some fresh wind of the spirit in on you and pray for you and all that too. Amen. Amen. So let's get going here. Um, Let's start with this message, this series that's starting in the book of Romans. I got two things that are certain in life. Number one, you're going to die. Like awkward silence. (laughs) You're going to die. But before you do, you're going to make mistakes. (laughs) <laughs> Does that make you feel better? You thought I was going to say taxes, didn't you? No, not everyone has to pay their taxes. Some of you know that. Bad. Don't do that. No. Two things that are certain in life. You're going to die, and before you do, you are going to make mistakes. You're going to miss the mark. You're going to fall short. You're going to depart from God's way of living. It's just a fact of life. It's called having a sin nature. Having a sin nature. You know, a, a great definition of a sin I heard recently was wanting to get something God always wanted you to have the wrong way. That's interesting. Think about that. Things like being prosperous. You know, God wants us to be prosperous, but he wants us to get there the right way by giving, not by taking. I could go on and on about that. We could talk about a lot of issues, but um, If we're going to do a series on the book of Romans, which we are, you got to know that the first big chunk of that talks about sin and salvation. That's why the title of this message is called Sin and Salvation. This series on the book of Romans, uh, this is the reason why I wanted to do this series right now in life. Because there's no better book than the book of Romans who Paul wrote to a church in Rome. There's no better book to teach us how to live a Christian life life step by step by step by step romans man it's so good i would encourage you guys to go back and just start reading the book of romans because it shows us just step after step after step and the first five chapters in fact are all about sin and all about the real way to attain salvation show of hands this is silly show of hands who sinned come on raise your hand if you have 
Dang, somebody looked around and said, I came to the wrong church. Man, this place is messed up. I am out of here, man. A bunch of sinners up in here. Let's narrow that down a bit. Who sinned this week? The week just started, y'all. I mean, are you crazy? Who sinned today? Come on. There it is. Come on, somebody. Yes. Now we're talking. The, some of us need, just need to know that sin is something not that we need to gloss over. Not something that we need to pretend is not there, but something that we need to say, no, no, it, it does happen, and I want to know how to deal with it. That's the truth. I want to know how to deal with this, because the truth is that we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. The truth is we're all born with a natural disposition to sinning and going away from God. And that nature, check this out, this, that nature doesn't go away when you get saved. Some of you are like, wait, what? I thought he made us new. I thought we were born again. Yeah, but guess what? You still have flesh. See this right here? It used to, they used to call this your flesh. It's actually my skin, right? But it's the flesh, the biblical term. that They'll say flesh, and it's, it's your body. It's what you want. It's the part of you that wants to wake up and eat ice cream for breakfast. Hey, <laughs> got an amen out of that. Come on, somebody. It's the part of you that wants to hug a lady that ain't your wife. No amens there, but that's the part of you that does it. It's your flesh that wants to do that. It's your flesh that never wants to exercise, ever. It's your flesh that wants to cheat on your taxes. It's your flesh that does this. And you're stuck with it until the day you die. <laughs> you're stuck with it. Man, good news, pastor. Man, I'm sure glad I came to church today. Wow, this is real encouraging. Hey, I love good news. Anybody who's been coming a lot of time, I mean, you know I love to keep it light. I love to keep it fun. But you know, good news ain't so good if you don't know what the bad news was. It's like Jesus wants to save you. And somebody's like, from what? I'm good. So you got to know a little bit about the bad news before you can start talking about how good the good news really is. Can I get an amen right there? That means that the greatest person with the greatest church, with the greatest job, with the greatest family, with the greatest salary, with the greatest house, with the greatest pets, with the greatest upbringing is going to fall short regularly. So what chance do you and I have? Because we don't got any of those things. What chance do we have? It, it, it feels a little discouraging, doesn't it? It feels a little, don't you worry, just wait right there. I'm going to come back for you right there. It means not only are we tempted to do wrong from the outside by the enemy of our soul who hates us, and he dangles little things in front of us and says, hey, look, son, right there. Why don't you go get that? It's like a little temptation outside. Not only do we have temptation from outside of us, we, we want to do bad things from the inside of us. Man, how messed up are we? We are messed up. Yeah. We are. Man, it's, 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 totally, it's totally crazy. And Romans, Romans does a pretty good job about telling us about the disposition of sin that we actually have. I, I got a common ground story. I want to just like make the, I want to take a step down here and get like level with y'all for a second. I was in Nashville this last week, like I just told you. And I got to tell you, man, going on vacation for me, it's like my flesh has a heyday. I like to take staycations because I like my routines, I like my schedules, and I like my, my stuff all lined up. It really keeps me going. It's like building a trench and saying, okay, flush, and it tries to get out of there, but it can't because you have habits and routines that actually keep you safe. I'm actually going to do a whole series about forming good habits in your life coming soon, all right? Look forward to that. But I have those, and I love them, and they keep me safe, and they keep me going in the right direction. But when I go on vacation, forget about it. They all go out there because I eat whatever I want. I wake up whenever I want. And it's like my flesh is going, yeah, now we're going. Now we're talking. Now I'm feeling good. Give me some more ice cream. Ah, I'm sure I gained at least five pounds when I was on vacation. It happens to all of us, not just you. I'm not sitting here like this. I'm saying this is us, <laughs> okay? We all struggle with this. And some of us don't have to go out of town to feel that, and neither do I. We feel it every single day. That's why it's so important to recognize, man, I have a disposition to sin. I want to deal with it. I want to learn to deal with it. In fact, I, I worry about people who think living a Christian life is easy because they might not be doing it right. <laughs> Just flat out. 
people that put that, that face on, you know, they walk, you walk in church and they're like, how's, how's everything going? It's going good. Yeah, going great. But behind the mask is like, I'm dying inside, but I don't want anybody to see that. Can we just get real in church? That we all have struggles? That we all have problems? That we all have things that we deal with on a regular basis? Man, what good am I doing to you if I just stand up here and lie to you? Telling you that, you know what? Just put the right mask on. Fake it till you make it. No, rather not. I'd rather not tell you that at all. But people that think that living the Christian life is like easy, man, I, I worry. I worry about that. Sin is real. It has power. Let's face it. Let's deal with it. Let's talk about first these first five chapters in Romans. Chapter 1 talks about how God is real. His, his invisible qualities are made visible in nature. When you read Romans 1, you're going to see that right away, that, that no man has an excuse, really. But we instead, we turned to the sin of the world, the things that the world has to offer us instead of what God has to offer us. Chapter 2, since God is real, He's going to really deal with people based on their actions and their attitudes. Romans doesn't waste any time. Really, Paul, the writer of of Romans, doesn't waste any time talking about, listen, this is bad news, everybody. Sin is real, chapter 1. Chapter 2 says, and God is real, and he's going to really deal with us appropriately. And you and I both know what we really deserve. But don't worry. Don't live there. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Chapter 3, following the law. Let's talk about trying to be good enough on our own. Following the law can't make you righteous. Romans talks about this and does a beautiful job. Following the law, just doing all the things you think you're supposed to do cannot make you righteous. The law simply shows us how sinful we really are because we can't do it. Try it. Just go and try it if you think you can. Take every law that's in the Bible and try. You know, I don't need Jesus and his sacrifice. I don't need all that. I'm just going to do exactly what God thinks I should do and see how that works out for you. See you in an hour when you can't do all the things that it lines out to do. Chapter 4 says this. Look at Abraham. Uh, Abraham is the father of the faith, the father of the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When, when Abraham was walking around, there was no Ten Commandments. There was no law. There was no nation of Israel. This is a long time ago. And Romans does a good job of talking about how was Abraham made righteous? How was Abraham, if there was no law, then how could Abraham ever have done anything good? But chapter 4 talks about that he was made righteous By his faith in God. He believed in God and God counted to him as righteousness. And chapter 5 goes on to say that just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam. You know, Adam and Eve, they're the the first humans and we, and they messed it up. And we inherit that sin nature all the way down, every single one of us. And now we get it. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. But just as sin came into the world through one man. So salvation came into the world through one man, Jesus. Jesus. Now we get to the good news. Now we get to the good news that Romans wants to show us. In your notes, and we're going to start getting to our notes a little bit, so this is in your notes. I want you to write this in. For every sin, there is a Savior. For every sin, there is a Savior. Man, some, some, some preachers don't like to preach about sin, but I'm like, And why not talk about the thing that's bothering us the most and talk about the way out is through a savior, not through a list of rules. But in fact, our savior leads us to living in such a way that sets us free. Another way to say that is for every sinner, there is a savior. So not only for every sin action is there a savior, but for every sinner, you and me, your son and daughter, your mother and father, For everybody, there is a Savior. The first big chunk of the book of Romans is conveying a very simple message. We are all sinners, and we don't need to be better rule followers. We need to be better Christ followers. Now, that's a big breakthrough for some people. Because some people grew up thinking, man, it's it's because I keep breaking the rules. That's why my life ain't going right. I just need to learn how to follow the rules better. No. No, we need to learn how to follow Jesus better. 
Because you'll never be able to follow all the rules. But you can always follow Jesus because Jesus loves you. He's a person. He's personal. It's easier to follow a person than it is to follow a list. That's important for us. Because the law in and of itself can't save you. The law in and of itself can't save you. When we learn to depend on Christ, the natural byproduct is doing th- the things that he desires. When we learn to follow Christ, when we learn to have a personal relationship with him and follow him in step through his word, through prayer, through worship, the natural byproduct is doing the things that he desires. That's why trying to buckle down and get a grip on your own sin never works. Come on, I know somebody knows exactly what I'm talking about because you've tried. You've tried. Year after year, you've tried. Over and over again, you've tried to get your anger under control, to get your lust under control, to get your, your lying, your gossiping, your cheating under control. Whatever you got, you know what it is. I don't. He does. You've tried to get it under control yourself, but that'll never be the answer. But when we follow Jesus, the natural byproduct is living a life that honors him. It comes from within. It comes from a desire to follow him, not just wanting the result. It's called putting the cart in front of the horse. It's like, I want to like, try and live good, and that's going to lead me to Jesus. No, Jesus leads us to living good. It's like wanting to be a doctor for the money. Listen, you won't get through med school with that kind of, with that kind of mentality. I, I know a few doctors, and you got to have a desire to, to love people. And if you don't, you're a bad doctor anyways. <laughs> You ever seen a doctor, you know, you ever, you ever had a checkup from a doctor who was in it for the money? You know when you see him. There's a lot of illustrations about this. It's like, it's like wanting a ministry position because of the authority it gives you, because of the respect it brings, rather than the people that you want to help. There are many examples of this, but when, when Jesus came, when the New Testament was written, something very significant was brought to the surface. In the Old Testament, it was all about action. Do this, don't do that, do it exactly this way. But Jesus said things like, if you are angry with someone, you are guilty of sin. He took it up a notch. Before it was, if you kill them, then you're guilty of sin. If you strike them, you're guilty of sin. Now it's like, I didn't even do anything. I'm getting sinned out for just having emotions. Because it's, it's, it's in here that sin starts. It's not out here that sin starts. It's in here that sin starts. Jesus brought that up. He said, no, if you're just, you don't even have to hit them. You don't even have to say anything to them. If you are angry with them, you are guilty of sin. He said other things like, if you even look at a woman... With lust in your heart, you are guilty of adultery. I'm like, come on, man. You are killing us over here. How is anybody supposed to do this? How can any of us actually do, never be angry? Give me a break, Jesus. That's, come on, let's admit, that's crazy. How are we never supposed to even feel those things? But Jesus was, was, was speaking to something like, no, you thought, You could do it through the law, but no, you can't because the law actually speaks to the heart. You're putting the cart in front of the horse. The issue is your heart is angry and your heart is lustful. It's not the action that's causing the brokenness. It's the heart that's causing the brokenness. If you're angry with someone, he went deeper than the surface. It's like these balloons right here. That's why I got these balloons on the platform is because, you know, they look like one thing on the outside, but they look totally different on the inside. We'll talk about that. The world would have you think, clean up the outside, and you're good. Just put the mask on and, and, and say all the right things, do all the right things, and, and, and you'll be all set up. But Jesus came and said, no, it's not about that. It's about what's on the inside. You've got to deal with the inside first. Jesus came, came saying, you can't get clean by cleaning the outside of the cup. No, you have to clean the inside of the cup. Because if you clean the outside of that coffee cup, but you still got moldy coffee in there from before on the inside, do you really want to drink out of it? Ugh. You ever drank out of a moldy cup? 
Oh, man, it's so bad. It is so nasty. No, we're going to look on the inside to see what's going on. That, like, uh, there's a lot going on in there we didn't know about. What about right here? This is not a gender reveal. And you're left with whatever was on the inside. The outside may have been clean, but the, outs- the inside makes a mess. <laughs> What's on? <laughs> I didn't practice this beforehand. Can you tell? How's my face, honey? Is it all glittery? No. Okay. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. She said no because she loves me and she cares about me. Are you taking a video right now? What the heck? I'm just kidding. This whole thing is on video. (laughs) The world wants you to think that what's on the outside is what counts. The world would have you say, "Just, just put on your Sunday best, show up to church, pay your tithe, raise your hands during worship, close your eyes, let everyone know how spiritual you are, and you're all right. But Jesus said, no, I'm not going to pop this one. No, there's, there's some stuff rolling around in there, and I don't want to deal with the outside. Because if you clean the inside, the outside will be clean. That's what Jesus said. If you clean the inside, the, the inside, the outside will be clean. So I want to tell you, I want to spend the rest of our time together talking about how to do that, talking about what what we need to do in order to get the inside of us clean. Because it's actually very simple. It's not complicated. It's not mysterious. It's not hidden. It's very simple. It's in his word. And I want to explain it to you right now. So go ahead and turn to your notes. This is where it's going to start to get real noty. All right, so you can write some things down. Lots of scriptures. We saved it for, we saved it for the end, okay? So here's some action steps for you. Number one, to get the inside clean. Getting rid of those sin roots. Roots. Getting rid of those sin roots. Number one. Confess to God. Confess, just confess to God. Just tell him. You know, it's really, it's as simple as it sounds. Hey, God, I'm really angry right now. (laughs) Hey, God, I'm really struggling with this lust thing right now. Hey, God, I'm really struggling with this honesty thing right now. Even though tax season is over, we were like, but still, let's play on that a little bit. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Hey, God, I'm really struggling with this. Just tell him. Confess to God. Listen to what 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says. If we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. There it is again. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. And notice what it says. It doesn't say that if you confess your sin, like he's nice. He's kind. He is kind. He is nice. That's not what it says. It says he's, he's faithful and just. You know what that means? It means he said he would. And God's not a liar. If he said he would forgive you, then he will Because he's faithful to do what he said he would do. He will forgive you. It's not, it's not, oh, God's so, he's going to, he's going to, you know. No, he's bound to it. He's bound to forgive you. That's why it says he's faithful and he's just to forgive you of your sin. If you confess your sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you from all unrighteousness. Man, that's a life verse for me. You know that? You know, I, I memorized that one early on. In my salvation, I really did. I really did. Our OSL equip class uh, turned us on to memorizing scripture. And that's a scripture I memorized a long time ago. And anytime I'm struggling, you know what I tell myself? If I confess my sin, he is faithful and he's just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God, cleanse me. God, I'm telling you right now, I'm struggling with this. Please create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. People who conceal their sins, people who conceal their sins and just focus on what's on the outside, cleaning the outside of the cup, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, 
But if they confess and turn from them, they will. Everybody say will. Not might. They will. They will. You, you will receive mercy. You absolutely will receive mercy. Don't conceal, but reveal to God. Don't conceal your sins, but reveal them to God. This application is first because it's the most important. Because if you can't tell God, you can't tell anybody, right? Man, if you can't tell God in your prayer closet or your prayer garage or whatever you got, if you can't tell him there, then this is number one. Confess your sin to him. The best weapon we have against sin is open communication to God about our shortcomings. Not walking around feeling like a failure, but living every day in the reality that we need God's grace. Remember that there's two people. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but there was two people that Jesus talked about praying at the altar. One of them was like, thank you, God, that I got all my stuff together. Thank you, God, that I'm not like this fool who's a tax collector and a sinner. Thank you, God, that you've made me so righteous on the outside. But there was another man praying right next to him that said, that had his face to the ground and said, God, I can't even look at you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, one of those men went home forgiven. You want to take a guess which one? You all know which one. Number two, confess to each other. Confess to each other. Now we're getting a little spicy. <laughs> now, we're, now we're having some fun. And I'm not talking about we don't have a booth here where you go into the booth and you confess your sin to somebody there. That's not what I'm talking about exactly. It is kind of the same, but it's not. Listen to the scriptures about it. James 5.16, it says this. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. How do we receive healing? By talking to each other. By having people in our lives like a life group. You ever thought of that? It's in the Bible. It's important. It's our healing. It's our healing. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This maybe is my favorite of the day. I love it. Even when we are weighted down with troubles... Anyone ever felt weighted down with troubles? Go ahead, a little show of hands. Anybody felt weighted down with troubles before? It's all right, the rest of you. I got your number, I know. I know. Because if I feel weighted down with troubles, you probably feel weighted down with troubles sometimes too. It's all right, I got you. Even when you are weighted down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. Ooh, that's weird. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. Listen to this, verse 7. We are confident that as you share in your sufferings, that as you share in your sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives. Wow. How many of you knew that was in there? Bible's good, y'all. It is good. It has good stuff in it. It has good advice. It's better than good advice. It's the natural law of things that when we share our suffering with one another, that is exactly the way we get comfort. What's going on here? When we confess our sins to safe people who love us, our family, our, our best friends, our closest relatives, the people that care for us, safe people, people in your life group, people from your church, those family members that that are walking with the Lord as well, if you have any of those. If, if not, then you have mothers and fathers here. You have brothers and sisters here in this church. Confessing your sins to save people who love you, and we tend to find out that we're not that crazy. <laughs> we tend to find out that we're not as crazy as we think we are. You know, when I, when I keep my sin a secret, I think I'm the only one with it. Anybody felt that way? I'm the only one. Oh, no one's got it as bad as me. Oh, no one does this. No one does that. I tell one person, they're like, oh, yeah, I did that too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's extremely comforting, actually, to feel like you're not alone anymore. To feel like you don't have to fight this fight alone anymore. It's extremely comforting. Sharing, with your, sharing your struggle brings God's comfort. But that's the first thing we want to do when we're struggling. What's the first thing? We want to hide it. Why? It's, a, it's your flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to tell anybody because then that might blemish the outside. 
But what actually happens is the inside gets cleansed, which will actually, it's a, it's a false way of thinking that if I, if I don't tell anybody about it, it must not be happening. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all know that's not true. But if we tell others, if we confess our sins to one another, we receive God's comfort and we, and we get the things that we need. I'm telling you, God is saying, share your struggle. Don't keep it a secret, everybody. Share your struggle with a safe person and you're going to experience God's comfort. That's why I make such a big deal and I sound like a broken record sometimes. Don't do life alone. Get into one of our life groups because life is better together. See it? It's right there. I wrote it on the wall. Life is better together. Don't do summer alone. This summer, get in a life group and tell them, hey, you know what? You know, once you get to know the people there, now it doesn't mean you need to go like first time in and be like, Tell everybody everything right away. You know, you can, you can be kind and courteous about it. But let me just tell you the truth. You're going to find so much relief when you begin to do this, when you begin to take life groups seriously, when you begin to get in small groups of people that care about each other and love one another that you can share your struggles with. Life groups, everybody, they're so important. Last one is this. The last application is this. Number three, check your motive. Number three, check your motive. The others were how to deal with the struggle, how to deal with the sin, what to do in case of it already happening. But this one is where it starts to get a little proactive. Checking your motive is a little bit like that John Chris comedian, check your heart. You ever heard of that? Somebody's laughing, but some of you don't know who I'm talking about. Christian comedian named John Chris. Go ahead and do yourself a favor. Go follow him. Go find him on YouTube because he's hilarious. And he just put out this song. I actually don't care for the song very much. But it's called Check Your Heart. Check in Facebook, in church, check your heart. And all these other things you're supposed to check your heart about. But, it, but it's true. It's a, it's a church term that means check your motives. What it really means is check your motive for everything that you're doing. Listen to Proverbs. Proverbs has a lot of wisdom for us. It goes like this. Proverbs 17.3. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests what? He tests the heart. He actually tests the heart. He says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send fire. I'm going to send trouble, and it's like fire, and it's going to burn out every impurity to see what's really going on there. Because sometimes in our biggest struggle is when our true nature comes out. What's really hidden down there, if, that if you're struggling with some roots, if you're struggling with some roots of bitterness, if you're struggling with some roots of anger, if you're struggling with some roots of being passive aggressive, that when pressure comes, it's going to come out. It's going to come out. It's only a matter of time. It's going to come out. Like you can clean the outside of this balloon all you want, and you can have everybody believing that you got your stuff all together. But when, but when the testing comes, check your heart. Check what's in there. Check what's going on inside, not just what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. What's going on in our heart? No, we need to check our motive because God is going to come through. And he's going he's to test the purity of our heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says it another way. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Does it say guard your image? <laughs> Does it say guard your Facebook profile and put only the best pictures on there? Does it say guard your persona, what, they, what everybody else is looking at? Or does it say guard your heart? Guard what you have going Guard your roots. Guard your roots. Because from it spring the fullness, for it determines the course of your life. A great definition of sin that I already told you about is, is trying to get something God has always promised you, but trying to get it another way, trying to go another way to get it. Um, I got a couple examples, and these might hurt, okay? So just hang on to your seat, okay? Hang on to your seat. Let's talk about sex. Now, God intended us to experience this. God intended us to enjoy this. It's not a sin in and of itself. But when we try and get pleasure and go around God's way of actually having it, marriage, then we sin. Then we're out, because it's outside of God's way 
of getting the thing that he's always wanted you to have. Some people think that God is like some Debbie Downer. Like he doesn't want us to have joy. Like he doesn't want us to experience pleasure or something. Man, God invented it. Every tingle, every little bit of it. Oh, my face is so, it feels red right now. I'm okay. He invented it. God created it for our pleasure. But when we go outside of God's plan of how to get it, then we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. We do. We really do. Let's talk about joy. You know, God wants us to have joy. He wants us to have this exuberance and this overflowing and this elation. But a lot of us try and get that not in church, not by really letting go in worship and letting God have all of us, but we, we try and get that through, you know, drinking and drugs and, and clubbing and going to parties and doing this other things. It's the same feelings, but we're going after it the wrong way. In your Bible, it says, don't be drunk on wine. Be drunk in the spirit. Like, God's spirit will actually give you that sensation. Now, I'm not opposed to, like, drinking. Jesus drank wine. He had his first miracle, he turned water into wine, all right? That's got to say something, at least. And coming from an alcoholic, that, that means a lot, coming from me, that it's not, it's not like that. What I'm trying to tell you is it's a heart issue. It's a heart. If I'm going after something that God intended to give me in a way that God didn't intend me to go get it, going to get something uh, apart from God, Okay, God, I don't need you for this kind of joy. I'm going to just get it faster and quicker right here. I'm telling you, the joy of the Lord comes with no hangover. The joy of the Lord comes with no jail time. For me, that's what, that's what all that means. But don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that if you, like, drink a glass of wine with a steak. I'm not saying that's, like, evil or sin. Don't, you know, people think that way. But I, because I'm an alcoholic and an addict, I don't do that. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is it's in here. If you're chasing something, and it's a line to cross, and, and the Lord will test the motive of the heart, and you've got to be honest enough to test the motive of your own heart so he doesn't have to, and say, you know what? No, I, I'm good with this, and, and everything is fine, and I'm good. Or you need to say, you know what? I'm leaning on that a little bit. I'm leaning on that, and I'm not, I'm not seeking the Lord for that. Um, how about prosperity. I talked about this a little bit. Having prosperity. Check your motive. Prosperity is, is not a bad, God talks about it a lot, that you, would, that you would have all the things that you need. But the way that God intended us to get it was not the way a lot of us try to get it, by keeping, by taking, by withholding. No, he wants us to be prosperous by giving. He wants us to live with our hands open like this so that he can flow resource through us. The most generous people I know are the wealthiest. And the wealthiest people I know are the most generous. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but I'm just telling you from the word of God that God doesn't not want you to have those things. He wants you to get after it the right way. Man, don't chase after wealth by, by taking and stealing and by stepping on the backs of others in the executive ladder. Don't do that. Be generous. Let God come through. Because he can come through for you in a way that no man can. That's a good place to say amen right there. You can do a good thing for the wrong reason and the wrong motive. And you can do a bad thing for the right reason and the right motive. That's a huge thing. The, an example I have, because we're raising small children right now. And we can want to do a right thing, like discipline our kids. It's a good thing to discipline your kids. But when, when I test my heart, I need to be like, okay, why am I disciplining my child right now? Is it because I'm stinking mad? Or is it because I want them to learn and grow? Oh, that's something I have to deal with every single day. You can do the right thing disciplining your child. It's the right thing. But you can do it with bad motives. Because I want to just get out my anger. So you can do the right things with the wrong motives, and you can do the wrong things with the right motives. That's why I say number three to this is you've got to check your motives. Check that heart, everybody. Check your heart. What's most important is the motive, the heart, the intention behind the action. The intention behind the action will rise to the surface and will consider you either free, either saved, either, either right in the eyes of God, 
or not. The motive, the motive. Check your motive. Why do I want this? Why do I do this? And when we make mistakes, when we fall short, when we miss the mark, remember, for every sin, there is a Savior. Never forget that. For every sin, there is a Savior. When dealing with sin of any kind, here is what I want you to remember. Talk to God. Talk to others. And talk to your heart. Confess to God. Confess to others. And check your heart. Is that easy enough to remember? Man, a message on sin was never so applicable. Talk to God. Talk to others. Check your heart. Can you do that for me, everybody? You're going to be living a free life if you can learn to practice this every single day. Because sin is something we have to deal with every single day. What if instead of feeling condemned for our sins and never feeling like we're able to measure up, we embrace a new paradigm of life that says, in Christ I'm made clean. In Christ I am forgiven. In Christ I am made new. In Christ I find my Savior. And as long as I stay close to him, there is literally nothing that can shake me. What if we could learn to look at life in a new way to say, as long as I'm following him, I'm good. As long as I'm following him, I'm good. That no matter what mistakes may come, no matter what trials may come, no matter what burdens may come, I follow step by step with Jesus, and I never let go of that relationship I have with him, and I'm fine, I'm good. And I may look messy on the outside, but I'm focused on the inside. That I don't mind getting real in front of everybody if it means it's going to clean up my heart. I ain't going to play it safe and be like, hey, y'all, I'm fine. No, I'm going to find safe people to talk to about it. I'm going to confess my stuff to God. I'm going to get real. There is literally nothing that can shake us when we look at life this way. What if we stop trying to fix ourselves and simply follow Jesus with all of our being, trying to fix all of our own mistakes? knowing it is not in and of ourselves to be made right or whole. It is only through fully and finally following Jesus that we have any kind of life worth living. Only through him. Because you can have everything without Jesus. You don't have anything. And listen, you can have nothing. But when you have Jesus, you have all you need. You have all you need. I think right now is a good time to give an invitation to get right with him and to say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I want to come home. <laughs> I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. With your heads down and eyes closed, I want to tell you this one last statement. You don't need me. You don't need the best church. You don't need the best preaching. You don't need to have everything perfect in life. All you need is Jesus. And that happens when you invite him into your life. I want to talk to two groups of people right now. Please, this is a holy moment for some people right now. So let's try not to stir. Let's really open up our hearts to hear from God right now. But there's two groups of people every single week. There's two groups of people that I want to give an invitation to. Group number one is you've never, you never heard of Jesus. Maybe you've heard of him, but you never heard about him this way. You never heard that he's the one worth following with our whole life, that he loves me, he cares for me no matter what. He's not a, it's not a list of rules I need to follow, but he's an individual that conquered the grave, sent from God. Today's the day. Today's the day to give your life to him and say, I'm, I'm done. I'm done trying to live this life on my own. I've tried it. It doesn't work. I'm over it. I'm ready to come to you. Second group of people is the people that used to have a relationship with God. And I know there are so many of us out there that we used to be really close to God. We used to have a really tight thing. Maybe we grew up in church or but something happened and you've drifted away and now you're not as close to him as you know you know you're not where you should be with him and you've walked away from that saving grace you've walked away from your salvation and i'm telling you son daughter if that's you 
the Bible has plenty to say about you as a prodigal son, as a prodigal daughter. The father has been waiting for this day. and He's not mad. He is not mad. He is so excited to receive you back. He is so excited that he comes running towards you. This goes for every single human being on the face of the earth. When we come to him, he comes running to you. If that's you today, And if you want to give your life to Jesus and say, I'm done trying to live this life on my own, but I want to live my life for Jesus, I just want you to lift your hand right now. Go ahead. Lift it up high. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see you. Amen. Go ahead. Lift it up high. Be bold. Now's your time. Now's your chance to say, God, I'm living for you. Amen. I see you. Amen. God sees you. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's pray this prayer together for the sake of those who lifted their hands to say, I'm giving myself to you. And let's say this bold and loud. Let's pray it together. Just repeat this after me. Father God, I give myself to you finally and fully. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit and lead me in this life. I give you everything. I give you every sin knowing you forgive me. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for those that gave their life to Jesus today?